Good morning, and thank you for joining us for our webcast. We have two great speakers from Moss Adams speaking on our topic today. Uh, Justin Fisher works closely with business owners and high net worth individuals and their families to develop customized wealth management strategies that align with their goals. Justin takes a holistic approach, developing thoughtful, targeted financial plans and offering investment management expertise. Uh, Mark Meyer has been in the public accounting since 2001. He helps develop tax-efficient strategies for manufacturing, distribution, transportation, construction, and real estate companies, and provides tax planning, consulting, and compliance solutions for individuals, closely held businesses, partnerships, and corporations. And now I'm going to turn it over to Justin to begin today's presentation. Great. Thanks, Brooke. I appreciate the introduction and uh, everybody on the line. Thanks for for calling in today. Uh, just really quickly to give us your pers uh, our perspective, you know, I think a lot of you are familiar with Moss Adams. Uh, we're a firm that is primarily a West Coast presence, uh, over 100 years old, have clients nationally and globally. But more importantly, what, what we're really trying to do today is deliver this kind of blended perspective between interacting with private clients, uh, business owners, individuals, and doing personal planning with families and that like, which is more of my background, as Brooke was mentioning, and then, and then Mark on the business side and kind of marrying up some of those, some of those concepts. So Mark? Yeah, and just, just to give a little bit of perspective on uh, my, my experience, uh, you know, work with dozens and dozens of, of companies, individuals, the size of the companies vary anywhere from you know one million dollar company to a billion dollar company, but I would say most of our clients are in the you know fifty million to five hundred million dollar range. Uh, most of my clients are personally closely held businesses or or family owned. Uh, we do work with a number of private equity groups. Uh, most of the time, that's because a private equity group maybe came in and acquired a closely held business. So um, you also want to touch base a little bit on the audience today. I know we have you know few hundred folks uh, joining us and you know looking at the list it's pretty evenly split between CEOs, CFOs and business owners and shareholders. So it should give you a little bit of perspective of uh, who's joining the call. Real fast just wanted to show you a kind of a high level agenda of what we're going to be going through. Uh, you know Justin and I did add a number of uh, case studies to uh, what we're talking about. We just really want to give some real life examples and add some perspective as we go through uh, some of our, our talking points on this. Um, you know, also, make sure you ask questions uh, throughout this. We're going we're gonna to try to answer questions as we're going through the presentation. If we can't answer the question while we're going through it, uh, depending on the volume of questions and so forth, then uh, we'll make sure we follow up and, and answer it uh, after the presentation. So. Okay, here's our, here's our first slide of the presentation. This is, uh, we thought this was appropriate for our economic update. Uh, I'm, I'm not an economist, uh, you know, and you know, with economic updates, you've probably, uh, most of the folks on this call have probably heard as many economic updates as they can count on their fingers and toes. So uh, I'm going to tell you my perspective on what I've seen in the economy with working with uh, different businesses and so forth. Um, you know, over the last handful of years, we've seen a number of business owners have to make really tough decisions. As we went through kind of the economic slide, uh, we've seen them trim the fat, and then they started cutting into the muscle, and then they're down to the bone, and you know that really took its toll on businesses. Uh, we've seen a number of uh, business owners and shareholders have to put capital back into the business. Um, you know that's that's the easy part in in this process, putting money into the business. But at the end of the day, when you want to take that money back out and kind of rebalance uh, your wealth portfolio, that's a little bit more difficult than it is to, to put money into the business. You know, and we've seen a lot of uh, companies have to go through a lot of change in order to survive, whether that's, uh, you know, change in their business model, changing their personnel and their structure. There's just been a, a ton of uh, change management that companies have had to go through. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's, you know, I, I heard the term, this is the new normal quite a bit. And, you know, that's, that's really interesting, the new, new normal. How, how are we going to operate at this level but still be successful in, in accomplishing our goals, uh, both as a business and individually? So if, uh, you know, if you're watching this presentation with somebody, they've probably been in the, in the similar boat from you. Everybody give a, a group hug real fast. We made it through the, <laughs> the tough times, and now we're, uh, we're uh, moving on. 
Okay, next slide. So you'll notice there's another cartoon here. We actually, you know, thought of the idea of giving our entire presentation with cartoon slides, but it didn't fly with our QC group, so we just isolated it to our, our economic update. So the last last couple of years, uh, we've seen businesses become more profitable. Uh, they've had different challenges, like how to uh, retain the talent base. We've done a number of uh, consulting agreements with companies on incentive compensation plans and just how to keep employees as as companies pull out of the recession, there's just such a, a bigger pull for, for talent. We've seen companies go back into the growth mode. Uh, we've seen a ton of consolidation in the industry in, uh, across all industries, a uh, number of buy sales happening uh, on a daily basis. You know, we've also seen a lot of our uh, business owners you know, want to take you know, chips off the table. And I mentioned earlier, it was, it, was a lot of, it was really easy to put kind of chips back into the business, but now when you want to take chips off the table, how can you do that really in a, a tax-efficient uh, manner or a manner that's going to really maximize what you end up with at the end of the day? And that's kind of the rebalancing concept that I think you're going to hear us talk about throughout our presentation. So that leads us into our first polling question. Over the past six years, what has been the biggest challenge for your businesses? Banking relationship, price pressure with customers, talent retention, personal financial strain to see it through, or change management. And as we're waiting for some of the responses to come in, um, you know, Mark and I kind of aligned some of these polling questions also just to get a little better feel of, of the audience and, and what some of the things you're looking at doing, uh, what your perspective is. And also, um, to earn CPE credit for today's webcast, um, just respond to three of the four polling questions that we have. And also I'll mention if you'd like a copy of the slide deck today, you can download them uh, via the folder that says slide deck at the bottom of your screen. And we'll also send up a follow-up email to slides as well. So looks like we're getting some plenty of responses here. All right, let's see what challenges lie ahead. Okay. Price, price pe pressure with customers, I think, is our winner there. But you see a, a change management, actually. Yeah, you'll see a, a, there's an even split across all of those issues. And I think, you know, you can only really select one, but I, I think everyone, you know, a number of folks will agree that all those issues really um, were kind of prevalent throughout these uh, last handful of years. So, And I'll say, you know, from a change management perspective, that's really interesting. It doesn't surprise us. I guess that's something that we're talking a little bit about is how businesses are moving uh, and owners and shareholders are thinking about um, how this, how their business and how the environment affects them individually and what they need to do to adjust their business in this environment. So that's great. Keep moving along here. So this next slide, I, I really like this picture. It gives a perspective of, you know, when we think of someone's uh, you know, personal wealth and, and wealth allocation, you know, a lot of the times they'll, they'll be heavy, that'll be heavily weighted into the business interest. And you know, when we think about you know planning with the business and also planning with shareholders and, and owners, you know, looking at the business's goals and the, the shareholders' goals are it's, it's really important to kind of intertwine those together. Just because uh, you know the business at the end of the day is the, the golden goose, and and decisions uh, you know that you make for the business are really going to affect other areas of you know everyone's lives, your employees in your business, and then also you know, what's going to happen with you as an owner in terms of your wealth allocation. So, you know, keeping the golden goose uh, happy and productive, you know, of, you know, oftentimes really drives the decision-making process and, you know, for better, for better or worse. Um, and, you know, we, we use that term uh, pretty intentionally because it is like a, a marriage uh, b between the two. Absolutely. And so, you know, I, just to maybe reiterate a little bit, I mean, you see on this left side, you can look at this as a figure eight, like we said, or a racetrack, and oftentimes focusing so much on the business, especially in a time of economic downturn or economic uh, volatility, and just really branching out to say, well, how are you addressing individual needs, family needs? Uh, you know, we put here, you know, put a plan in place. Gosh, that's so confusing. You know, the marketplace has financial plans, estate plans, insurance plans, investment plans. I could probably keep going. Um, it's confusing for, for owners to try and navigate that and what, what is a plan, what is the real value in that. And so we want to focus on kind of maybe taking a broader picture of growth and assets and looking and saying, you know, one of the most undervalued 
part of planning is just organizing these assets and getting getting a snapshot, almost like a balance sheet of where I sit today from my assets, from a value, from a cash flow perspective, what are the risks involved. And then, you know, the second bullet point, how do I, how do I educate uh, my family? How do I educate uh, either the shareholders or employees or people who are going to be taking over this business? I mean, that's the one thing about businesses is, is looking to move to perpetuity, and succession is clearly a, a, an enormous factor in that right now. So that's kind of what we'll be, what we'll be going through a little bit. You know, one thing too, um, you know, when Justin, you mentioned a lot of planning, and so who's who's the the parties that are going to be a part of that process? I was really happy to see our mix and participants today between CEOs, CFOs, and business owners, because you know, as CPAs and uh, investment advisors, of course, we want to be a part of the the team that does the planning, but it's so often that the financial executives in the business, you know, often p- play the largest role in this planning process. So uh, we're really happy to see the audience today. Absolutely. So let's get a little bit more perspective uh, and kind of start that planning process and give you an example of some of the things that we start to look at. Um, So this is just a life cycle. I'm sure you've seen something like this before or or maybe something exactly like this. But this is is the way that we approach a business life cycle and a personal life cycle. What we've realized uh, of working with businesses in closely held context, owner-managed context over the years, is that this business life cycle – uh, from starting the business, uh, you know, having all of your eggs in that basket towards going into a growth phase, starting to diversify, starting to build scale, capitalization, towards actually thinking about transition. What we see, and you'll see on the top line some business uh, it's strategic issues like business financial planning or expansion or enterprise risk management, they're really in tandem with the personal side. So, personal budgeting, getting your wills together in estate planning, retirement planning, uh, assessing your goals, philanthropic efforts, uh, working with uh, the next generation. These things really run in tandem. Uh, And it's helpful for a business, the shareholders, again, the constituents involved, to recognize, hey, where are we at on this timeline? Kind of maybe where have we been, but where do we sit today? And where would we like to go? What are our strategic plans of where we'd like to go? So anything you'd add to that, Mark? Oh, I think that's a good summary. Okay. Well, then, you know, from that, maybe we'll get, get a little bit more information about you in that context. Um, so pretty easy uh, question. You know, Mark and I are really good at, at making easy poll questions. <laughs> um, so, you know, where would you consider yourself along this timeline? Or even you could substitute yourself of the business, the ownership, shareholders involved along this timeline. Really in, in a startup mode where you're still trying to, still trying to capture – value, uh, working on that enterprise value, or actually starting to work in the growth phase, or actively either working through or been through a transition, I guess. Looks like we have some responses coming in. Okay. There we go. Growth. Not surprising. It's really, really interesting. Um, You know, I guess we would, we would, Maybe predict that. A um, couple things about this that I think are interesting, Mark, you can chime in. But, I mean, with, with this recession and, and coming out of it, we're seeing a lot of opportunity, and this is really representative of our client base. The transition slide, actually, Mark's got a couple of case studies on that in a little bit. But that side of, of, of what's going on here is huge. I mean, the demographics involved, obviously the baby boomer generation. When we look at our client base um, uh, and, and clients around, you know, their stats of 60% of businesses that are in the privately held space are looking to transition their business within the next five years. Yeah, and I think you know if we if we look back, you know, five seven years, you know, from you know before right now, uh, a lot of a lot of business owners felt like they were kind of at the tail end of that growth stage and kind yeah. of entering the transition phase, and they kind of moved back down the mountain a little way. Sure. Said, hey, we have to shore this thing back up. So now, as we you know as we're seeing companies pull out of the recession, those same business owners are saying, hey. I'm thinking about taking some chips off the table. And so as I approach the end of the growth phase and look at transition phase, you know, how can I effectively plan to maximize my wealth through a transition? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so moving along, so assessing, we, we looked at the life cycle of things, you know, and, and you shared, you know, the primarily uh, a lot of you are in this growth to transition phase. So one of the things that, that, we, that we urge or we're fans of for businesses and their owners to do is to take a look and say, Well, if I assess the allocation of my wealth, so if I look at a personal financial statement or some type of balance sheet, 
uh, of ownership. What does that look like based on what phase I'm in? And, and, and we give an example here of startup to growth to transition. And, of course, there's commonalities or themes that are similar. You know, this, this just clearly looks at saying, hey, as we start up, the vast majority of my assets or, or our wealth are going to be involved in the business, right? We're, we're plowing everything back into the business. As I grow, maybe I'm capturing some more real assets, some more real estate. Maybe we're um, working on some side deals to diversify. Maybe we're buying buildings and having the business lease back to us or these kinds of things. And then from a transition standpoint, you know, typically looking to monetize, you know, some type of business asset. I guess your comment was take chips off the table. Yep. You know, and so that, that, while that's common, that's not paramount for everybody. Um, and when we assess these areas, you look at liquid assets, real assets, and ownership interest. You really need to look at them also from a, a risk return profile. You know, from an investment standpoint, we're not going to go into uh, liquid investments like stocks and bonds today. We're not going to talk a lot about that. But I think uh, a lot of folks on the phone, if you're just kind of thinking about your 401k or something that's, that's pretty common, you know, you're saying, hey, bonds are, are risk averse, you know, or, or more conservative and stocks are more aggressive and I make more money in the stock market than I do in the bond market, but I take on more risk. So those kind of uh, classic risk return components are uh, prevalent throughout real assets and ownership as well. And we, we see uh, that ownership interest in a business is obviously the highest returning asset, and it's the highest risk asset. Uh, real estate would probably be the second. You know, if you looked at uh, cap rates or internal rates of return on, on different types of real estate, you would see those exceeding the, that of capital market assets like stocks and bonds because of the increased risk. Uh, some of that is liquidity risk, which we'll talk about later. But just getting a sense of where this is at is a really nice starting place, and we're going to walk through a case study on that. Yeah, and you know what I'd say, too, in looking at these three different slides, you can see the transition slide. There, there's a big piece of the, of the pie in, in liquid assets, and I would say more often than not when we see a business owner go through transition, that's what their wealth allocation looks like immediately after a transition. Sure. But then I, what I've seen also is, you know, they'll be more aggressive in re reinvesting back into different ownership interests just because it has the highest return. Yep. And typically business owners are, you know, seek a little bit more risk for, for their return. So I think you're going to consistently see that wealth allocation model move for, for folks. Yeah, maybe step back into the growth phase, right? Exactly. Once you've taken exactly. some. So given that, uh, kind of, we'd like to learn a little bit more again about you. So, so with this context in mind, you know, if you're looking at either your asset base as an owner or ownership group's asset base, we, we looked at uh, where you were at from a timeline perspective. Where would you say you are at from an asset base perspective? The question, as you can read, says, you know, which of the following buckets would you say uh, that you're most heavily weighted in? Would it be that ownership interest in business or businesses, at different LLCs, different things that you're involved in, or would it be, you know, real assets um, that you have exposure to? Or, or is it liquidity? Very good, very good. So, gosh, I, I wouldn't have guessed that. You know, pretty evenly distributed across the board. Um, I guess that would align with the growth comments yep. uh, of most of most of the uh, callers being on from a growth standpoint, and, and businesses' interest in real assets are really the driver, like you were talking about. Yeah, and, you know, we're talking a lot about allocating between these different buckets, but, yeah. you know, the goal is to actually look at the pie and have the pie grow to as big as possible, right? Sure, sure, you absolutely. Know, it might be the same allocation, but it's going to grow. Yep. So how can we make that happen? Absolutely. So so in this context, let's, let's take a look now. And so what we'll do is, is walk through just a case study that hopes to give you an example of – of how you might look at value, cash flow, and risk in this context and, and get that really nice snapshot of where you're at in order to help you make decisions about how you may adjust that going forward. So this is a, you know, this is a multi-step process. I guess this is kind of probably could have put on there step one, but this is probably step one of four um, that you could employ here when you're looking and saying, okay, now that I've recognized where I'm at in this life cycle, uh, I kind of understand, you know, my my asset base from a business interest, real asset, and liquid standpoint. Uh, you know, we're fans of breaking that out further, right, and organizing it. And, and this table on the right might be a little difficult to see. I'll quickly walk through it. But just organizing it between asset classes that are common themes, like income-producing real estate, commercial properties, 
a rental home portfolio, anything like that, or even adding, you know, a non-income producing real estate, whether it's undeveloped land, even personal assets that you have, primary residence, vacation home, those kinds of things. Mark would probably put a, a snowmobile on his, I think. <laughs> Maybe. But, um, you know, and then moving on to kind of to the liquid side. So in this case, you know, you have some fixed income uh, or bonds, right? So in my, you know, non-qualified investment account, that's my my joint account, uh, you know, I have some, some fixed income there, or my 401K. And also looking at um, the treasury function of your business. So in t- internally, on your balance sheet as a part of your working capital, you know, what type of short-term uh, corporate accounts do I have and how are those allocated? I think something Mark is going to hit on in a little bit later. And then what's my exposure to broad market stocks, uh, you know, kind of equities across the board, uh, Dow Jones Industrial Average concept. And then where do I have exposure to cash? Um, you know, what type of cash do I have? Where is it held? Um, I know what it's earning, but, uh, you know, taking a look at where your cash is at. And then obviously business interest, and I just lumped it on there, but you can break that out, uh, which commonly is broken out into various entities that have different, different uh, exposures to them. So ultimately just getting a, getting a feel for what this allocation is is a nice starting point. Um, we're real fans of saying, hey, you know, now I know in March of 2015 where I'm at, how I'm allocated, where do I want to be? So we can look back in 2017 to kind of look at some trending of this concept. And what goes hand in hand, I mean, what we see with, with owners and, and businesses, the two kind of major themes are value and cash flow. What is the value? What, what is this enterprise value I have? And what is the cash flow that it's spitting out? And so we try and do the same thing uh, when we're organizing that context. <coughs> Uh, for for cash flow. So looking at the assets that we just described, that commercial property, those rental homes, those uh, investment accounts, your corporate account, your 401k, business the, the business, absolutely a huge portion of this in this uh, in this graph. You know, what is the cash flow that those are spinning out? You know, and sometimes there's discrepancies, right? Like raw land, it's very valuable, but but yet to be developed may not be producing any income. Matter of fact, may be sucking income. And so getting a feel of where your income sources are from helps us to further, and what I'm moving to is assess risk. I think, Mark, you could also do the inverse of this. I mean, this is a nat- net of tax picture, Yep. but it, you could look at uh, your tax exposures, right? Yep. Yeah, totally. All the different interests where you have uh, investment allocations are going to have a different tax exposure. Sure. And it plays a major factor in, in your cash flow by yep. different sources. And I think a little bit of, you know, from from a tax planning perspective, which obviously all of you are aware of, that helps to adjust cash flow as you go over time. Right. right. So, so once we know those two things, you know, we, we're understanding value, we're comfortable with that, we're understanding cash flow, um, we actually want to take it a, a little bit further, a step further, which, which we really think is uh, probably the most important point, um, and, and looking at, at risk and talking about risk and, and understanding risk. And when we look at risk in this context, our goal is not to mitigate, mitigate risk. You know, as an owner, ownership, we very rarely see owners constantly looking to mitigate risk. Our goal is to understand the risks that we're exposed to and right-size them, feel comfortable with them, plan for them. Uh, you cannot have return without taking on risk in, 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 any, in any sense. And so this is a start of how we like to talk about risk based on asset class and how you like to assess it, not mitigate it. So just starting at the top here, you look at business interest, and on this on the on the horizontal uh, axis there, we've got different types of risk, and I'll talk about those. On the vertical axis, I have a very detailed, just joking, red, yellow, green uh, bar graph just to show you. But I mean, you can kind of high, medium, low this this thing. You don't have to have an exact percentage or something, but uh, getting a feel for what those risks are. And, and so when we look at the horizontal. There's a, there's a ton of risks out there in the marketplace. You know, um, this, this horizontal of this graph can be 20 different very specific risks. And so we kind of just break it up into five that we think cover uh, major asset classes between these buckets. Economic risk, right, so how susceptible am I to uh, the economy or the geography that I'm in, um, the con- consolidation uh, that I have of, of my assets, uh, liquidity, a big one, clearly, and in this context, we're trying to show that clearly a part of business interest and real assets. I can't uh, turn in my shares of my company tomorrow for uh, some ski lift tickets or something like that, right? You have this liquidity factor, and you're receiving a premium for that because 
you can't just turn around and sell something immediately. You should receive a higher rate of return. What's my credit risk? What's the risk that I'm going to get paid back, right, when I'm making loans or that I'm doing business with somebody? And then what is my risk to pricing? You know, how am I, how am I having a risk of pricing? You know, future price increases and inflation in general. And then interest rate environment, uh, clearly one right now that's getting a lot of talk of with expectations of rate, rate movements either in June or towards the end of the year. Um, you know, what, where's my susceptibility to interest rates? What's that mean to me? I constantly hear about Janet Yellen uh, potentially moving rates, but really how does that affect my asset buckets, right? And so what we like to do is just walk through and, and, and doing an assessment, you know, we have some questions that you typically can answer, but, but you could do this and kind of walk through and say, well, where would my risk lie from a high, medium, and low standpoint based on, on the major buckets that I have? And I'll skip down to the bottom one of liquidity. That's the, that's the most flexible asset you have, of course, right? And that's the easiest to offset risk in different areas. In this, in this example, uh, it's highlighting that it's helping to balance out your overall risk pie, given that that was an objective, a sample objective of yours. And that's what we always say about the liquid asset base. I think Mark was talking about it a little bit before. As you go through transition, you monetize illiquid assets, you deploy those, Ill Ill or those liquid assets back into business or real assets, you want to still make sure that your kind of combined risk is, is, uh, is watched and monitored. And that gets you to this consolidated picture, right, if you were looking at your overall risk. And this is where, again, you want to say, well, well where am I at here in March of 2015? And does that surprise me at all? Does that, is that where I want to be? You know, is, and, and one of the concepts that, that I'm going to hand it off here to Mark that we're going to really start to talk about is this idea of rebalancing. I think a lot of you uh, on, the, on the call are very familiar with rebalancing. It's this idea, if you think of your 401k, you put in $1,000 a month or something like that, and that $1,000 automatically gets chopped up into different areas and allocated appropriately, and your 401k kind of rebalances that sometimes in these funds that you may have. It will essentially look at selling things high, maybe uh, in this context uh, U.S. stock, and buying emerging markets or something, so selling high and buying low, and, and constantly maintaining a risk profile and return profile that is preferred based on the strategies you set up. Yep. Yeah, and from, from a high level, uh, just the, the rebalancing concept, I think, in, in context of our uh, presentation today, it really looks at rebalancing between a business interest and uh, the individual. And, of course, there's other buckets in there, whether it be real estate, uh, you know, liquidity, and things like that. But, you know, how do we rebalance between the business and the and its shareholders and owners? Yeah, and I, I think one of the fundamental mm -hmm. concepts that we're trying to get across is it's easy to do that with liquidity. It's right. simply, you know, you sell stocks, bonds, these kind of things, shift things around, that's easy. But how do you appropriately do that with your business assets, with your real assets, you know, because there's a lot more involved in that process. And one thing that I just thought would be interesting to mention, you know, recently um, Warren Buffett's uh, shareholder newsletter came out. Uh, pretty cool read, you know, gosh, he's been managing uh, Berkshire Hathaway for 50 years now, which I guess I didn't totally realize. But in reading that, you know, there's two main themes that he's really talking about from a value perspective. And it was this idea of capital reallocation within Berkshire Hathaway and business succession, ironically, was another thing he was talking about. But I'll just read a quote from the newsletter. He said, at Berkshire, we can, without incurring taxes or much in the way of other costs, move huge sums from businesses that have limited opportunities for incremental investment to other sectors with greater promise. And that's that concept. You're notifying when a business or an investment has has come to a high, you want to start to take risk off the table, and you want to diversify to see uh, an opportunity and get some capital exposure to that. So that's really what I think Mark will talk through, and we'll try and give some advice on from an entity structuring perspective, especially yep. it relates to businesses that are moving towards transition. Right. So this next slide, this kind of just shows an agenda of what um, we're going to go through uh, the next, you know, 10, 15 minutes of, of the presentation, and we have some good good slides and, and examples. But, you know, when we think about rebalancing the concept between the, the business and the, the shareholders, uh, you know, first, you know, how can we create cash flow within the company that might help us uh, achieve that? You know, when we, once the cash flow is created, how can we move assets out of the company if that's what we want to do sure. in a tax-efficient manner so, so the, the value of that asset isn't getting chopped off at the legs on, upon movement out of, out of the business? You know, if you want to take chips off the table, um, you know, what are some ideas on how to maximize the value through that process? 
you know, keeping assets in the family, this is huge. Um, you know, there's a slide at the end of the day that kind of talks about where assets might go at the end of the day and some things to think about. You know, I wanted to mention uh, personal guarantees in here too. And I say that because uh, in working with a number of uh, closely held businesses, you know, 10 years ago, this, the, the subject didn't, didn't come up uh, as, as an issue for owners. As we hit the recession, this is actually uh, what kept owners up at night and, and, you know, their personal guarantees on their business. So now as we kind of move out of it and we're seeing companies be more profitable, uh, the question is asked, hey, how do I remove uh, my personal guarantee, uh, you know, with the business? So, you know, if we go through this again, I don't have all those sleepless nights that I had before. You know, and really, um, you know, that's that's the question. I said, okay, well, let's, I'm going to, you know, we work with a number of different bankers and so forth, and so I asked a, a handful of bankers what are their thoughts on that. And, you know, I got pretty consistent answers across the board. Um, you know, one banker was pretty, got pretty excited about it and kind of started um, just kind of going through a different uh, a list of different things. Hey, you have to have a fortress balance sheet, uh, good liquidity, keep cash in the business, good working capital. Your covenants are going to be tighter. There's going to be more transparency in your business. Uh, you know, if you have a financial statement review, uh, your covenant might now require you to have an audit performed. Uh, you know, there's going to be more conformity with your uh, more conforming uh, credit terms in your business. So, you know, really they talked about, you know, just seeing a really financially healthy business. But as we pull out of the recession, that's what we're seeing more with our businesses where they're, you know, financially healthy. Their balance sheet is can stand on its own. And so it's really a time to, uh, you know, start talking talking with your uh, bankers or, or other folks who might be requiring a personal guarantee and get that process started, at least the conversation started that, hey, this is a goal and, you know, how do we get there? And it's, you know, uh, the, they also said this is definitely something that can be done. You just have to manage uh, things a little bit differently. So uh, something to think about in the process. So, you know, first I want to talk about, you know, some different ideas about creating cash flow in the company. And, you know, cash flow analysis is, is interesting. I would say more often than not, uh, I don't see companies doing this on a regular basis. They're not looking at their cash flow and planning uh, the next, you know, 12, 24, 36 months ahead to say, hey, you know, what sort of cash flow am I going to need to accomplish my business goals? But the first step is to really identify this because one thing that we found is oftentimes, uh, you know, we'll go through this analysis and there'll be actually excess cash in the business. And, you know, businesses one of the most riskiest investments. And so you really don't want to, you know, keep excess cash in the business and, you know, keep it subject to, to business risk, right? Mm -hmm. So that's one thing to think about. So first identify, hey, is there uh, opportunity to move cash flow out of the business? Uh, you know, some in, in moving, you know, in creating cash in the business, tax planning can be absolutely huge. Uh, you know, a few ideas. Uh, looking at your accounting methods to save taxes. So, you know, you prepare your financial statements, and most of the folks on this call, I think, are, are financial folks. They understand this. You have a method of accounting for a number of your items in your business on your balance sheet. You know, for tax purposes, you can actually treat certain items uh, in a different way than you treat them for your financials, financial statements. So reviewing your accounting methods and trying to identify opportunities to create additional fl cash flow are important. So, for example, uh, if you're a manufacturer or distributor, if you have inventory, there's a number of different methods that are available from a tax perspective to employ and use a different method that, are, that is going to create cash flow for your business. Uh, transportation companies, service companies, a number of different accounting methods. You know, the most popular uh, accounting method change that I think folks will understand, are you on the accrual basis or are, are you on the cash basis? And that seems like a pretty simple concept, but a lot of the times uh, companies aren't maximizing their accounting methods they're using for tax, and you know maybe there's some restructuring that has to take place to allow you to take advantage of these things, but there's huge tax savings dollars out there. Um, I'm working on two accounting method changes uh, for clients right now. One of them is creating a $7 million tax deduction in one year that's going to create $3.5 million of cash. Another one's a $4 million tax deduction that's going to create you know, about $1.52 million of cash. So those are huge cash inflows uh, for, for these businesses. And, you know, when I think about these companies, both of them are in the growth phase, and they really need this capital to grow. They're expanding into new markets, and it's a huge saver. 
you know, we often see it too where maybe the company is not in the growth phase, maybe they're in the transition phase. So this creates excess cash that, you know, then we can plan to, you know, maybe rebalance out of the business into another bucket. Yeah, and a part of that, I mean, one, one thing I think we've seen, you know, as in the theme of the economic rebound is companies being a little bit cash heavy. I mean, right. certainly public companies is off the charts, you know, with the record S&P 500 numbers of cash. But yep. then how do you do that? What is your, I'll call it treasury function, as a private business to allocate that cash appropriately, earn some type of yield on it, but then keep the right equity, right? Yep. You know, yeah. not be over risky, I guess. Yeah, totally. And, you know, in thinking about these accounting methods, I think, um, you know, a lot of them are technical in nature. So it's important that the advisors that you're working with, the CPAs and, and other folks, really understand your industry. A lot of these methods are industry specific. Uh, and they understand your business, so they know how to identify the methods. It's, it's really important. You know, the bottom part of the slide there, you know, just going through the planning process, if you do want to actually take cash out of the business, what are some different ways to do that? Uh, you know, when you look down that list, those none of those uh, items on the list there are going to be shocking to anybody, but all of them actually have uh, drastically different tax consequences. Uh, distributions, depending on your entity structure, those may or may not be taxable. You know, salary, well, can we just, you know, pay the owner more salary? Well, you know, there's an employment tax associated with that. And, you know, if, if, you follow, if you follow some of the changes in Congress over the last few years, you know, there's an additional Medicare tax. There's the, you know, 1411 tax, which is, you know, commonly known as the Obamacare tax. So these taxes come into play across all these items right here, uh, some more than others. Personal guarantee fee. Well, you remember that personal guarantee that was keeping you up at night, are you actually being compensated for that? And so uh, one common way to, uh, you know, that we've seen owners pull money out of business is to pay themselves an actual fee uh, for guaranteeing the, the debt of the business. Rents to related parties, uh, loans. Now, loans is, a, is an interesting one. Uh, I think you have to be careful with that. You really have to plan around it. Um, what you don't want to end up with uh, down the road that we've seen happen in a number of businesses is five years from now, there's a whole bunch of loans, uh, you know, to and from the business, or to and from related entities, and no one can remember you know, why those loans were set up or what they're doing there, and how do we get them off our balance sheet, right? Yeah. And so, uh, you know, this planning process through all those items right there, it's important to, you know, make sure, you know, make sure you're talking to your bank and they understand what's going on. Other readers of your financial statement understand what you're doing. Uh, you know, transparency is always better in talking with uh, lending institutions and, and uh, other readers of your, of your uh, financial statements, so... So moving assets out of the company, uh, you know, we're going to go into a couple of case studies after this, but real, real fast, you know, looking at your entity structure is very important. You know, depending on what your goals are and, uh, you know, both long-term, short-term, you know, what do you want to do after the growth, growth phase? You know, how do you want to transition? There's, uh, you know, a whole, whole host of, of different uh, entity, entity structures that you can set up that will help you accomplish that in a way to, to maximize the, the value through that process. You know, everyone's familiar with LLCs, S corporations, C corporations. You know, all those are very different, and they all have uh, distinct advantages and disadvantages depending on uh, what your goals are going to be. So it's really important to look at that entity structure, understand um, which one's best for for your specific situation. You know, and also, you know, what we've seen, you know, with legacy businesses especially, where uh, it's maybe been around for a hundred years, is you know, you'll, you'll get a business with it has real estate in it, it has operating assets in it, it has maybe at passive or personal assets in the business, and you know, no one really knows what to, to do with those assets. And so how do you take those assets, um, you know, if you want to isolate the real estate or, or personal assets from the operating assets to reduce risk, how can you best accomplish that? Uh, you know, those are definitely uh, questions you want to ask yourselves and go through a planning process because there are ways to achieve that in a tax-efficient manner. Why don't we jump to the next case study? Well, Mark, you know, I want to uh, see, I see a question that um, we've got from the audience. And okay. one of the things that they're asking about is uh, passive losses and they're right. being trapped. Um, I see that's so understood. Maybe you could identify that a little bit. Yeah, totally. Uh, you know, when we, when we think about uh, a, a tax situation, a lot of times uh, tax attributes are created over the years. So different tax attributes might be uh, passive activity losses. Uh, capital loss carry forwards, and that operating loss carry forward. And so it's important in the planning process you understand, okay, is there a way that we can utilize some of those loss carry forwards 
and create additional cash flow yeah. as we pull out of hard times. Yeah. Um, you know, because otherwise they're kind of go to waste, right? Yeah. I mean, you want to be able to maximize those as quickly as possible. Yeah, and looking for other types of capital you could allocate that would take advantage of that, that you could create passive gains as an example. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Very good. Yeah, and I, I guess that's you know another comment on, on planning for that. That's where it's really important to really, when you're looking at your business and is it creating capital losses or is, is there, you know, look at your investment, you know, strategy. Yeah. And so do you want to create capital gains to offset that, yeah. right? So just some simple planning there. Absolutely. Okay. Another polling question. This is our fourth polling question. When looking at the structure and assets of your business, how often do you evaluate changes aimed at efficiencies and maximization of owner shareholder wealth? Annually, based on the business cycle, when we realize it's a complete mess, we haven't done this analysis before. <laughs> <laughs> and we've seen all of these. And, you know, just, just really quick, I know you're going to go through a couple of structures, Mark, but, I mean, yep. what is some commonly, you know, what is a good idea to, to assess this you know, from a time? Well, I think it all starts with uh, really understanding, you know, what you want to accomplish. Yeah. You know, what's your timeline like? What's the, the future plans of the business over the next, you know, number of years? As you approach uh, in a potential event or, you know, a, a rebalancing, uh, mm -hmm. so to speak, it's important mm -hmm. to look at this more often. But, you know, at least every couple of years, really understand what your goals are and you know, go through this process of looking at your structure. Very good. Let's see if... Nice. All right. That's encouraging that, that folks look at this uh, pretty consistently. You know? Appreciate the honesty there with the complete mess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm going to go through a couple case studies. And, you know, I apologize. Some of these slides are kind of busy. These are actual case studies that, that we went through. But, you know, try to, try to follow along, and I'll try to make this as uh, simple as possible. But, you know, in this case, we had, you know, a, an, en an operating entity. Uh, this was a manufacturer. They had a main company that was set up as an S corporation that had a number of subsidiaries. They had a related company that was uh, part of the business. You see it on the left there, Company B, that was an S corporation with a few subsidiaries. And there was also an LLC that was a part of the business. Uh, you see that on, on the right. And so, you know, if we looked at this uh, entity structure, uh, just a little bit of background, uh, this company was in existence uh, for over 100 years, um, you know, four generations of closely held ownership, uh, a number of uh, environmental uh, reasons why maybe these entities were set up or operational reasons, also uh, reasons that couldn't be explained. Hey, why is uh, this entity set up this way? I don't know. They, they did that 50 years ago. Yeah. I don't know. Um, you know, as, as the business uh, prospered, a uh, number of assets accumulated in the business. There were some personal assets in there. Uh, there were passive assets in the form of investments. Uh, and there was a lot of real estate in the business, too. And some of the real estate was, was used in the business. And uh, some of the real estate was just, just passive, uh, maybe raw land or, you know, uh, at one point it was purchased for a purpose, and now that purpose has kind of went down the river, and now we just own the land, mm -hmm. right? So, um when, when we worked with this company, they said, hey, how can we really, uh, you know, do a few things? We do want to take our chips off the table at, at some point, but we want to simplify this structure, and we want to do it in a tax-efficient manner. And at the end of the day, how can we kind of move things around to, to benefit us in, you know, growing our pie and reallocating? Um, Which is a rebalancing, rebalancing exactly, that asset. Exactly, rebalancing our assets. So go ahead and go to the next slide. I'm going to walk you through the steps they went through. Um, you know, I guess... You know, looking at that at that first slide, I guess one easy way is, oh, can we just take the assets we don't want and distribute them out to the owners? Well, there's a there's a heavy cost to making distributions, uh, a lot, you know, a lot of times. And in this case, it was in the in the millions of dollars the cost of of doing the rebalancing. So we said, hey, is there a way we can kind of reorganize this to make it simpler, make it more operationally effective, and really accomplish some of our rebalancing goals? So the first step they went through, pointed at, you can see it at the top there, is they created a new holding company over top of the main operating company. And the goal of this holding company was to ultimately, at the end of the day, hold uh, the personal and passive assets. So how can we move those assets to this new holding company in a tax-free manner? Well, first step, set up a new holding company. This is done uh, tax-free. It's called a Type F reorg. 
let's see, step two. Okay, how can we um, simplify our structure in a way that people will understand it? So what they did is they took company A and company B that you'll see on the left and right right there, and they folded them into the main company. So this was a, a 351 transaction. It was tax-free, and they were able to uh, take both of those uh, related companies and put them underneath the main operating company. Okay, once once all of these entities were kind of under the same umbrella, now they were able to move those assets tax-free to the new holding company. If we jump to the next slide. Here's what the structure looked like at the end of the day. So now you have an operating entity and you have a holding company that holds all of the uh, passive assets that they wanted to retain. And you know, keep in mind, I, I mentioned that this company also wanted to at some point go through transition. And so in maximizing value in a potential transition, transition uh, you know, what's going to drive that a lot of the t most of the time is, is EBITDA. And so how can we you know, create a structure that's going to really isolate our operations and drive EBITDA up and take assets that aren't creating EBITDA and move them and ultimately keep them? Because there's a lot of value in those assets. Uh, and, and if they're not adding value to the EBITDA, it really you know, might not affect our the value of the company. So this allowed them to accomplish a lot of their goals. And specifically on this next slide, Reduce built-in gains tax exposure, which uh, remove risk, increase cash flow. Uh, they were able to isolate the, the real estate from the operating entities and other passive assets. I mentioned earlier there was a, a couple million dollar potential tax if we would have just distributed these assets out. So really tax-effective way of distributing the assets um, and really simplified their structure. So it's, it was a win-win all around. And this planning process was over the course of a year, a number of different advisors. Uh, working with the bank, working with other folks to make sure uh, everyone's on board with the game plan. And in that context, right, there's some monetization, like yep. we talked about, uh, yep. liquidity that's been deployed to other areas. So almost going from that transition phase back into the growth, but using those risk metrics to say, okay, how are we going to get more diversified? And this is a diversified business to start with. But how do we get some more diversified exposure to different businesses that might not be in the industries that we're commonly involved in? Exactly. So... This overall a restructuring process that really helped them rebalance to the added additional cash. Okay, case study two. It kind of works from uh, left to, to right right here. We have an operating company that's, uh, that's closely held, owned by uh, two individuals, and you know, they're saying to themselves, well, we might want to take our chips off the table, but we really don't want to sell our entire company. And so uh, that's where we're at at step one. Step two. Uh, we've created a new parent, similar to the last example, uh, where we dropped down the operating entity into uh, a separate and distinct entity, and then we converted that to an LLC, you'll see there in step three. So now we have the operating company, that's an LLC, and we have the, the new parent. Now, in this case, there weren't any passive or real estate assets that we wanted to move upstream and retain in the new parent. However, uh, if there was, this would have been a way to accomplish this tax-free. So, you know, real fast with the, the question, the, the specific reason of uh, setting up the holding company as, as an S-Corp, it's, 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 in, it's in both of them. So, yeah, in, in, in both these case studies, you set up the new uh, company as an S-Corp. So, in both of these specific instances, uh, the existing company was an S-Corp. And when we did the, the type F reorg where we created a new parent, what happens is, uh, the new parent becomes uh, the new S corporation and kind of steps in the shoes and inherits the tax attributes of the old S corporation. Uh, it was a, a choice of entity that was really driven off the existing ownership, mm -hmm. but we really asked ourselves, hey, how can we really create you know something new, move assets tax free, um, and ultimately you know sell the the operating entity of the, of the business. So that was kind of the driver why the new parent was was an S corporation. It's a good question. Yeah, good question. So if we look at this example, if we move into uh, step four, now that we have, uh, you know, at the bottom of the page there, now that we have a new parent, uh, they were able to uh, sell the LLC interest uh, for cash and then ownership of, of the buyer. So those those percentages were uh, can, can fluctuate in this specific example. So if they wanted to sell half their business, they could have done that. That they, in this specific case, it was about three quarters of, of their business that they uh, monetized for cash, and then they received uh, units of the new buyer uh, in exchange. So the whole operating entity moved, and at the end of the day, the the new parent 
now has cash and they have an ownership interest in you know what was formerly their operating entity, so they retain that. So if we click on the next slide, we can kind of see some of the benefits here. Uh, they took a portion of their, their chips off the table. It allowed a tax-deferred uh, rollover, and it was really uh, flexible in terms of how much we wanted that to be. Um, it allowed movement of retained and passive assets tax-free. I mentioned we didn't that, that specific uh, example, we didn't actually have that, but the, the structure would have allowed for that. It avoided administrative transfers, pain in the ass. Also allowed for continued taxation uh, of the business as a pass-through entity. Okay, so real, really quick here as we kind of uh, approach the close of our presentation, I really like this slide. Uh, it's the pirate ship that put the IRS flag on because it, it really strikes more fear into, into the villagers as they approach the village. <laughs> so if you think about you know, what's going to happen with your assets and your wealth at the end of the day, there's really four options. It's going to go to your family. Uh, it's going to go to charity. Uh, you could actually spend it all, maybe, before you die. Yeah. Or uh, there's a big chunk that could go to the IRS. So we wanted to put a big uh, plug in here just to say, hey, make sure you understand your estate plan, what's happening with your wealth, because it's a, you know, if you don't plan properly in that process, you know, what's going to happen is that pie is going to shrink quite a bit um, as, uh, when that time of day comes. Yeah, and, you know, just... just piggybacking on there. I mean, when we when we look back and you kind of think about that that wealth and the allocation at the transition phase or any phase really, you know, what we didn't talk about specifically today, uh, which is a really enormously important component for ownership and families, is to put together a personal financial plan that's comprehensive, that really does look at financial planning aspects from estate planning to insurance planning. So a lot of those things, you know, after you've gathered this data, that financial plan allows you to do some estimates on what those assets will grow to. Because the nice right. thing about looking at your wealth like that, you can say, well, I would expect my real estate exposure to grow at 8%. I would expect my liquid capital to go at 4%. These businesses probably 12%. So I'll know uh, 20 years or 15 years down the road or at least have some type of idea of what my federal or state or both mm -hmm. estate tax exposure is. And so how do I plan for that now and organize my asset base now while at the same time remaining financially independent? Which is which is the key. So, yeah, and, and it's important to note in that process too. I mean, what we see with most uh, clients is they they do have some sort of life insurance, maybe as a part of that plan. Sure. But more often than not, they don't understand if the amount of life insurance they have is adequate. Is it too much? Is it too little? Um, is it structured in a way that is actually in line with our buy sell agreements? Yep. So that's something that you really need to take a look at and understand because, like I said, when we look at that with uh, you know clients and companies, more often than not, those things are not aligned. So it's important to have those aligned. And that's that's like a low hanging fruit item, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, with the it's interest easy. rate environment being so low, a lot of policies have been underperforming for years, and so you can easily do a check on those things to clean yep. that up. So. Yep. So yeah, wrap. I mean, just kind of moving to a wrap up phase. We've got you know, roughly five minutes left here today. And to finalize things, I mean, we like that idea of looking at the, at your timeline and then within the timeline assessing those assets between the main buckets we talked about of business interest, real assets like real estate, liquid capital, and then doing a cash flow or net of tax cash flow analysis to figure out where these things are coming from. And then walk through, maybe you don't have to use our steps, but walk through this idea of where the risks lie in those buckets and what you want to, have risk exposure to as an ownership group or as a family uh, or, or the business in general, you know, yep. and then reporting a rebalancing strategy. Yeah, and, and looking at rebalancing, I mean, tax can play such a huge impact on rebalancing. Uh, tax structuring is a huge issue. I mean, those examples that we went through were real-life example where, you know, millions of dollars were preserved uh, both in value and then in, in, in tax dollars. You know, looking at your accounting methods, trying to create cash flow, I mean, there's real tax ideas that, you know, I, I mentioned two really large ones, the, the you know, $7 million tax deduction of sure. $4 million, But, you know, for every one of those, we have a dozen of, you know, $500,000 tax, tax deduction planning strategies right. by just looking at your accounting methods. I mean, there's a ton of different things you can do. And I would say also that, you know, all of those ideas are very uh, fact-specific. It's different for every company, what's going to work and what's not going to work. And so it's important to go through the planning process to see what's going to, you know, work for, for you. And, you know, just real fast on everything we've talked about, you know, we can help you through that process. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. This is our last slide. 
So I guess if you don't want to do any of that, you can always do like this guy does in the slide. He's going to retire on Friday and hasn't saved a dime. So, hey, investment advisor, here's your chance to become a legend. <laughs> <laughs> we love that. Yeah. So, so right now I think we'll, we'll open it up to a few questions. I know we just have a few minutes. Um, you know, Mark and I's contact information if you have any follow-up questions that you wanna, don't want to ask in front of the group today. I'm happy to, to give us a shout on anything like that. Okay, well, it looks like, uh, you know, we kind of hit some questions as we went. So thanks a lot for your time. We really appreciate it. hope these uh, webcasts are helpful information from you. We keep look forward to doing this throughout the year for, for our clients and, and business partners. And so, yeah, give us a shout if you have anything additional. Yeah, thank you, everybody, for your participation. Thanks, Mark and Justin, for the great presentation. Uh, for those of you who completed requirements to earn CPE, you can retrieve your certificate immediately by opening the certification folder at the bottom right and cl clicking on the certificate icon in the lower corner of the window. Uh, we will also be following up with an email in the next couple weeks with instructions on how to download your certificate if you have any tr trouble retrieving it now. Uh, this concludes the presentation. Thank you, everyone, for attending.